Uh, the Secret Keeper opens in 1961 with a teenage girl called Laurel who's sitting up the top of her childhood treehouse uh, while her family are celebrating a picnic on the stream that runs through their park. Now, Laurel is dreaming about a boy called Billy and a move she wants to make to London and a future she can't wait to seize. But before the idyllic summer's day is out, she will have witnessed a shocking crime that changes everything. I love you, you saying a shocking <laughs> crime with a, a big smile. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so is it, was it, I, I know what the crime is, but <laughs> was it, um, did you enjoy writing the shocking crime? Was that something that... I did. The, the first chapter of The Secret Keeper is one that I was working on while I was on tour in Europe and the UK last, uh, last May, June. And it was so much fun because it, it really is a complete story in a sense. And I got to take it from this really almost over the top idyllic setting into a really, really dark place. And I knew I was going to do that from the beginning. And, you know, I write for pleasure and for fun. And so that setup was, you know, a joy for me. Do you think that your, your readers would be shocked by how dark that is? Do you think? <laughs> um, in, in written form, I don't think so, but I read it aloud <laughs> recently. And, you know, sort of at the end, I sort of was looking over my pages, realizing that the audience were also having cream tea. And I, I thought, this is a bad idea. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, a writer has a natural storytelling rhythm. And mine happens to be they happen to be very long. Every time I set myself the task of a shorter novel, it still ends up being a very long book. Because there are certain things that I need to include that another writer might cut out, you know, layers of detail uh, that perhaps slow the pace sometimes, but that for me as a reader and as a writer are a really um, enjoyable texture. So I like the, the larger um, intergenerational story shape. Um, but, but as you say, within that, there, there are so many possibilities to um, explore very, very um, private and small, seemingly small relationships. Uh, one of the things that um, compels me to write, sort of a, an, a theme that is a bit of an obsession for me, is the way the past is always with us in the present. You know, I'm, I wouldn't be interested in writing an historical novel that is pure history. For me, it's the way it's tethered to the present that's interesting. And the idea of the, of the, the family secret or um, the return of the repressed, I guess, is another way of saying the same thing, is infinitely fascinating. You know, we all, uh, we inherit certain things from those who came before us, whether it's uh, buildings, another fascination of mine is the old building, or whether it's something genetic or something uh, else, like, like in The Secret Keeper, a, an event that has happened that has ripples that you know, float their way through the generations to follow. Slightly your question, do you believe in ghosts? That, that's not an odd question, I don't think, and I was just thinking about this last night because in, in some ways my answer would be, oh, oh no, you know, and I've never seen anything, but I can't say no. And I was just telling the story recently, my dad, who is the biggest, uh, he's an engineer, he's very straight down the line, he is not the sort of person to believe in ghosts at all, was telling me recently, much the delight of my children who are also with us, that uh, he, he owns a big old hotel in the mountains in Australia. And he's told me that, you know, because he lives upstairs after dark, some nights he's been down in the public bar, um, you know, putting things away and has turned around and seen things like all the doors open. And you know, okay, maybe he, you know, he's in the public bar, so maybe there are other explanations for why he was seeing things he didn't think were there, but I could never say no. And certainly as a writer, I am fired by the idea of um, hauntings, whether physical or metaphorical, from the past. As a writer, I write to go somewhere else. Um, and I write about things that I love, and I love it here. I love the old buildings. There's so much history, and it's such tangible history. You know, uh, I think as an outsider, I see things that are very uh, commonplace for people who live here, but that excite me. I, the aesthetics are beautiful, the landscape, as I said, the history, and the history goes back so far, which, you know, it's, I could just, I could keep researching forever and never write a word, and I think we just Satisfied. So, I mean, on, on your research, I mean, yeah. who, who do you read? Do you read non fiction, fiction to, to get both. your research? Going? Yeah, I, read, I do both. Um, in terms of um, reading, I love non fiction and I'll read straight um, history books. You know, I, I just have a new one by Judith Flanders about Victorian 
uh, London, you know, sort of Dickensian London, which is brilliant. Uh, but I think the most useful and the, the sort of uh, reading research that I like the best are memoirs because they're, the voice is what I'm trying to capture. The facts I can find in a lot of places, but the voice of a character living in a certain time can be more difficult to pin down. And so memoirs, uh, published diaries, published journals, published letters are the most useful way of gleaning facts from the past, but more importantly, um, understanding the voice. Uh, I think a lot of things that someone who lives here could write about with authority, um, that's not something that I, I can do. Whereas, perhaps because my books are set in the past, uh, many people living or writing now didn't experience that firsthand, so it's a little freer. Whereas if I were to suddenly try and write a very um, a social realism you know, sort of approach to what it's like to live in London now and be a young person here, that would be very disingenuous, I think. And I, I don't think I'd be able to uh, research enough to find the authority to do that. But I feel quite comfortable because my books are set in, in the past where I have as much right to be as anybody else living in the present. And you know, the funny thing, growing up in Australia, I read almost exclusively British books as a child. And I think so much of your imagination and, and the type of creative person you become is formed as a child. Uh, and you know, so I was disappeared inside Enid Blyton. And you know, it's particularly because my mum was a, uh, an antiques dealer. We spent a lot of time in second-hand shops. And all my books were published, you know, 1950 or before. So. I, when I first came to England, I felt that I knew it already. In the same way when you meet some people and you just have that instant connection as if you've met before, I felt like that about the, the place. At, at the moment, my um, passion is still, and my inclination is still to set books here in England, but maybe the older I get, the, the stronger the pull is to write about somewhere I know inside out. And in The Secret Keeper, you know, there's the chapter set on Tambury Mountain, which is where I grew up. And Vivian's experience where she runs through the bush down to the creek, I lived that. You know, we, we lived in a house that bordered the edge of the mountain and there was rainforest and, and you know, gum trees and creeks and ants and, you know, all that sort of thing, snakes that we, we would hide from. And that chapter was the easiest to write. It was the fastest to write. And readers, many readers have said it's one that comes alive for them and I, you know, that makes sense. It's, I, I think it says in, in the book, not to quote myself to myself, but it is something I believe that the landscapes of childhood imprint differently than, than those we meet as, as adults. They become a part of you. What are my fears in life? The, I would have to think about that and the first thing that comes to mind probably because I'm about to say goodbye to my family as they head back to Australia and because my when you have small children, they're such a loud part of life. My biggest fears always centre around them and their future and their well-being. A very, very simple answer, but one I'm sure that's shared by many parents. Um, my feeling about prizes is that as a writer, you can't take them too seriously. If you're if you're shortlisted, that's brilliant. If you win, that's that is wonderful and as it should be, and, and that's great. But more importantly, I think uh, what a prize can do for Book sales in general is a brilliant thing. Anything that takes people into bookstores and makes them pick up a book that they otherwise might have walked past. And you know, usually I'd say with most books, once you pick it up and start reading, you go on a fantastic journey. So that is always a good thing. Uh, bookshops, you know, you're talking to a writer, of course, they're my favorite, among my favorite places on earth. And a bookstore that I can remember very vividly is the first that I really met as a child, growing up on Tambourine Mountain, where there wasn't much at that time in the way of extracurricular activities for kids. Um, so I used to take drama lessons, which is all that was on offer. And it was in a tiny little shop um, at the back behind a bookstore. And the person who ran the bookstore was, an, you know, I think I was nine at the time. He was about 70, so he seemed ancient to me. Um, uh, his name was Herbert Davies and he had been head of um, Welsh BBC drama and he'd you know, moved to Australia with his repertory actress wife and they'd set up this little drama studio and bookstore. And he was the first person who directed me to, with reading material because I'd been reading in this kind of um, book lover's wilderness. You know, anything I could find I would read. And then I met him and his, 
his shop, his house, there were books everywhere and he knew them, they were catalogued in his brain, you know, so anything we talked about he'd be able to lift a sort of waxen finger and, and take himself over and find the book, the very book that I had to read next. And uh, that's, I mean, bigger, larger than the value of bookstores, that's the value of a bookseller, someone who loves books and whose greatest passion in life is to share them with other people.